Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the extended bonus edition of Great Decisions at Manitowoc Public Library. The weather almost beat us again, but not this time. Uh, as always, I would like to begin by thanking our sponsors for Great Decisions. Uh, we have the League of Women Voters of Manitowoc County, the Manitowoc Public Library Foundation, the Friends of the Manitowoc Public Library, Lakeshore Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and the University of Wisconsin Manitowoc. Just a few quick announcements before we start today. Even though this is the last Great Decisions um, installment for the year, please don't forget that coming in October, we will once again be doing our domestic issue series, and we're going, going to be doing it every Monday in October, like Great Decisions. So that will be coming up on the horizon. The other thing is, just don't forget to vote tomorrow. That was the other thing. So uh, just thought I'd throw that in there, and that's all you will have from me this evening beforehand. I would like to introduce our representative from the League of Women Voters who will be introducing our speaker tonight, Marilyn Sontag. Okay, I also have a sign and it's in the car that says vote, it counts. Uh, but I forgot to bring it in. So if you wanna go out and look for my car, <laughs> There's a sign that says, vote, it counts. Uh, this is our last, but I think often we save our very best for last. I know we often contact Beth Doherty while we uh, put together the program for the year and uh, ask her, could you come again this year? She's come for 11 years. Oh. Yeah. And, and she looks much older now, you'll see that. <laughs> All right, Beth Doherty is the manager, uh, professor of international relations and a pol uh, professor of political science at Beloit College. She teaches courses on international politics, the politics of Western Asia, the Israeli Palestinian conflict, human rights, the politics of mass atrocities, nationalism and ethnic conflict, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, and the war on terror. Beth's research interests include traditional justice mechanisms such as international criminal tribunes and truth and reconciliation commissions and the politics of Iraq and Turkey. A 2003 Fulbright Scholar to Denmark, she, sent, she spent four months at the Danish Institute of Human Rights in Copenhagen Conducting, in, uh, conducting research on special courts for Sierra Leone. Her most recent publication is a historical dictionary of Iraq, 2013, which she co-authored with Edmund Garib. She has traveled in extensively in the Middle East and Africa, most recently to Turkey and Jordan in the summer of 2015. Beth has received both campus and national awards for teaching. The 1999 uh, Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching at Beloit and the 2001 Rowan and Littlefield Award for Innovative Teaching and Political Science awarded through the American Political Science Association. Uh, Beth is leaving uh, tomorrow morning on the plane, so I sure hope that she could be with us tonight. Uh, she's going to a conference in San Francisco, the um, annual conference for International Studies Association. Um, I wanted something really personal to tell you about her, but I forgot to ask that. I think the, the interesting thing is she doesn't get her hair cut in Beloit. Where do you get your hair cut? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, so don't ask her where her football loyalties lie. Beth? I have, I have the, um, the thingy. 
I want to thank everybody for coming out. I apologize uh, for the, the, the last time, but I have a little tiny car and it really hates ice and snow, so we just thought it was, uh, you know, discretion, the better part of valor and all that to just um, reschedule. So uh, what I want to talk to you all tonight um, is the, the topic about Turkey. Uh, and this is actually a very um, difficult and painful subject for me. <clears throat> personally because I've made about 14 trips to Turkey since 2000. One of my closest friends um, in graduate school is a Turkish national. I have, um, you know, probably a dozen former students who are um, nationals of, of Turkey. And so watching what has happened in Turkey over these last several years uh, has been difficult. Um, because unfortunately, um, Turkey appears to be on the um, the slippery slope to becoming Putin's Russia. And uh, they're, they're going to be there um, relatively soon, actually. At this point, there doesn't appear to be any check on the power of Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, and he has every intention of staying in power until 2023. So what I want to do for you tonight is explain how um, Erdogan got to the point that he is at and then look at the aftermath of the attempted coup in July of 2016 because it, the coup really, um, although democratic values uh, and practices in Turkey were on the downslide even before that, it, it has become a full-blown authoritarian regime um, in the aftermath of that 2016 um, failed attempt at a coup. Um, so Erdogan himself became prime minister originally in 2002. Um, this was an unusual election because his party, the AK party or the AKP, was able to govern alone. And Turkey's parliamentary system is such that it almost always needs to have coalition governments. Um, the AK party had term limits. It said that, um, that there was going to be a three term limit for its members of, of parliament, which Erdogan had strongly supported um, as prime minister. Of course, he had to be elected to parliament and then he becomes elected to, as um, prime minister. However, this meant that um, after 2011, that Erdogan was in a position where he was not going to be able to run for prime minister again. Um, he was going to have served three consecutive terms, um, but Erdogan was not willing to step down. There was a, a meeting of the AK party shared by Erdogan at which they attempted to um, discuss whether or not they would change the rules so he could run for prime minister again. And Erdogan decided that they should in fact continue to have term limits. Uh, and they made this decision in the summer of, of 2014. The reason why is because Erdogan didn't want to be prime minister anymore. He wanted to be president, right? And not only that, he wanted to change the Turkish system to a presidential system. So it's a, a parliamentary system, or had been, um, and the president is largely um, ceremonial or you know an honorary position. They really don't exercise any political power. It is the prime minister who exercises political power in the Turkish system. Um, but then that means that, that the prime minister answers to parliament and Erdogan wanted to be able to rule relatively unencumbered. I'd also note that the, that the AK party, in terms of its internal party structure, uh, from the very beginning, people had noted that it was extremely um, undemocratic. It was very top down. It was very closed in its decision making. So even while it argued that Turkey should adopt democratic practices to allow Turkey to join the European Union, in its own politics, it did not practice um, democratic values. Um, so Erdogan is in fact, um, he is elected president, he gets 52% of the vote um, in August of, of 2014. Um, and he treats the office as if um, it has already been transformed from being ceremonial to being like the American presidency. He undertakes a number of different decisions which basically flat out were unconstitutional in Turkey um, because as president. He didn't have the power to do that. Um, but he largely just dismisses that. And he is open in public about this. Whenever anyone brings it up to him, he's just sort of like, whatever. I am the president. I will decide what we're going to do. And, and you know, it was clear the intention was they would amend the Constitution. All right. So August of 2014, he becomes president. 
he's looking towards the next parliamentary election because what he wants to be able to do um, is get enough seats in parliament that he will be able to um, amend the constitution without needing to rely on anybody except the AK party. Right? So if they had had, if they get 330 seats in, in parliament, then the parliament could call a referendum on constitutional changes. Right? If they could get to 367 seats in parliament, then the AK party didn't even need a referendum. It could just amend the constitution by itself. Right? And so you can see that its numbers have been quite high over the you know, 2002, 2007, 2011 elections. Um, and Erdogan is convinced um, that by the upcoming 2015 elections that he has put himself in a position where he's going to be able to do this. And there's two big reasons why they believe the time is right to amend the Constitution in, this, in 2014, 2015. The first one was the military had been quote unquote defanged. Right? The military had been a powerful actor in Turkey since the um, uh, establishment of the Republic in 1923. It was the guardian of the secular order in Turkey. But the military um, played an outsized role in Turkey. So they have governing boards, for example, um, for the university system. Uh, Yoke, the Higher Education Board, they have a similar board like this for, um, uh, for the press. Right? Well, the military always had representatives on those boards. And so when Turkey applies for European Union membership and looks like it's serious about this, you know, beginning in, in, in the 2000s, the European Union said, you know, you can't get in unless the military is brought under civilian control. The military needs to get out of politics. That was fine with the AK party, right? Because they saw the military as a check. AK is an Islamist party, right? and so the military saw them as a threat to the secular order, and the AK party saw the secular military as a threat to their ability to stay <laughs> in power. Right. And again, you know, the military has overthrown the government multiple times in Turkey, including the um, famous postmodern coup in 1997, where they didn't even need to physically move, they just needed to suggest they would overthrow the government, and the government fell. Right. Democrats, um, or supporters of Democrats, supporters of the European Union, human rights activists, they all supported the efforts to put the military under civilian control. And this was largely accomplished through two massive trials in Turkey known as Ergenicon and Sledgehammer. Um, in these trials, it was alleged that the um, retired and uh, active duty military officers were trying to overthrow the government. Um, initially, Many observers thought that this was, in fact, a reasonable prosecution. The longer this went on, the more doubts that came up, because it becomes apparent at a certain point that they don't really have very much evidence for this. This is clearly an effort on the part of the AK party um, and another Islamist movement called the Gulenists eh, to force the military out. But Ergenicon and Sledgehammer are successful. Those verdicts come down um, by the summer of uh, 2013. And so that's the first reason Erdogan thinks he's safe to move to, you know, to change the constitution. The second thing was that by the summer of 2014, summer 2015, he had really cowed the opposition in Turkey. Right? Um, the Press Freedom Index, according to Freedom House, um, had slid 50 places in Turkey between 2005 and 2011-2012 um, to 148th. Right? The Democratic Republic of the Congo was 147. All right. So Turkey has made a dramatic slide in terms of press freedom. Um, Erdogan's administration uh, and the AK party had shut down opposition newspapers. Um, they had uh, forced some opposition newspapers, um, you know, by attacking them on the, on the business side to sell off assets. Uh, State-run TV was largely a propaganda arm for the, uh, for the AK party and for, for Erdogan. So people are getting restricted information in Turkey about what is happening. That makes it easier for an authoritarian leader 
right, um, to convince the population to stay behind him. And I mean, if you just think about the, how this has been working in the United States over the past several years, where we've got these media bubbles, people only believe what they hear. Well, in Turkey, all they were hearing was the government line for the most part. Right? Um, the second thing was that there had been um, a great deal of legal maneuvering through parliament, which allowed them to block access to websites. Right? So you would think, because Turkey's super wired. I mean, everybody's connected to the internet. It has some of the highest rates of Twitter um, and Facebook usage of any place um, in the world. But they began to make it difficult for people to, um, to use those. It, the police cracked down on demonstrators, right? Um, and oftentimes they would um, they would uh, disperse people using like tear gas and using water cannons. They would arrest individuals. Um, they would call protesters terrorists. This becomes the major um, language in in Turkey. All of Erdogan's opponents are labeled terrorists. Eight, um, regardless of whether they have any connection to any organized movement at all. Eight, um, they rarely investigated any claims of abuse, of which there, there was frequently abuse on the part of the security forces. In the southeastern part of the country where the Kurds live, um, protests there, even by children, okay, so doing things like chanting things in the schoolyard at recess, were treated as terrorist offenses. There were several hundred Kurdish children, actually, who were in prison in Turkey for violating um, uh, anti-terrorist laws. And then you had had the, um, uh, the Gezi Park um, uprising in the summer of 2013. And I forgot to go through my happy uh, my slides. So this is the slide in Turkey's Press Freedom Index pictures of um, them putting the demonstrations down. These are pictures from Gezi Park. Um, you had as many as a million people that came out in Istanbul at this point in the summer of 2013. Um, and they were uh, uh, forcibly suppressed uh, with water cannons and tear gas, et cetera. In, um, and so uh, Erdogan, again, referred to the people in Gezi Park as looters and terrorists. One other thing about Gezi Park was while these, and th these protests went on for weeks, right? So every, every day, huge numbers of people were out in Gezi Park in the heart of Istanbul. Um, and at a certain point, CNN International was showing live footage of the protests, and CNN Turkey was showing a documentary about penguins. Right? And so the opposition um, adopted as their signal um, a penguin with his fist in the air and he's wearing a gas mask. Right? And you'll still see this um, stenciled in different places um, in, uh, in Istanbul or some people will still wear little buttons that have, the, that, have that. In the aftermath of, of the Gezi protests, um, Erdogan banned Twitter in the summer or in March of 2014 um, and banned YouTube. This is the second time YouTube had been banned and the first time it was closed down from 2007 to 2010. Right? I actually was teaching summer school in Turkey um, during that period and I would say things to my students like, well, you should go look for X and, and somebody would be like, well, we can't look at that. I'm like, what do you mean you can't see that? Well, that website's blocked. And one year that also included the website of the United Nations. Um, even when the Constitutional Court struck down um, the Twitter ban, it took the government four days before they complied with that ruling. Um, and. Uh, Turkey sent representatives to the United States to talk to the um, uh, heads of Twitter and of Facebook for help in pursuing those who were involved in organizing the, the Gezi Park um, protests. Right? So <laughs> they dominate this. For over the space of several years, no country has asked Twitter and Facebook for more information or for more closures um, related to uh, the usage of those sites than, in fact, Turkey did. 
And then, um, again, at the end of, of 2014, there were new laws that were passed that tightened uh, control of the internet and made it easier to block web pages um, without a court order. And in fact, when that legislation was going through the parliament in Turkey, you, you had fistfights that broke out. I mean, literally people punching one another on the floor of parliament over this. It, so, Erdogan believes once he becomes president, he's cowed the opposition, he's made clear he will brook no opposition, he thinks he's broken the spirit of the people that came out at, at Gezi Park, and he believes that the military has been effectively sidelined. So, at that point, he makes the decision that he is going to go after this organization um, called the Gulenists. Uh, Fethullah Gulen is a cleric. Um, he is actually in the Poconos in Pennsylvania. He's been in exile uh, from Turkey since about 1999. The movement that he leads is called Hizmet or Service. And um, it believes in Islamic piety. So, I mean, these are, these are um, you know, religious people. Um, free markets, democratic government, and tolerance. So Hizmet says that they are about cultural Islam, not political Islam. And in fact, they don't get involved in politics in Turkey, like they don't have their own political party, for example. Um, they don't come out and endorse political parties. Um, instead, large numbers of people um, who belong to the Hizmet movement moved into certain parts of the Turkish state. A lot of them joined um, the judiciary, so like the prosecutor's office, the judges, a lot of policemen. They had not yet infiltrated into the military until the Ergenicon and Sledgehammer trials in, you know, in the mid 2000s, you know, up to about 2010, 2013, when all those military officers were removed, then his men, people were able to move into some of those things. So it was also clear that it was now going beyond the traditional areas of the Turkish state where, where it had power. I should also note that at this stage, it is really difficult to get a good read on Fethullah Gulen, the Gulenists, and Hizmet. So if you read about them online, you either get the sort of, um, this is a wonderful organization, these are dedicated, pious people who are looking for um, social change, who believe in democracy, who believe in education, or you're going to get those who see this as um, a dangerous, secretive organization bent on infiltrating and undermining the Turkish state from within, and not a whole lot in between. And now, of course, in Turkey, um, you, you can't even have a conversation without Fethullah Gulen, about Fethullah Gulen and the Gulenists um, without risking going to, to prison. All right, so I'll explain that um, in a minute. Right. Um, the big thing that the, the Gulenist movement does in Turkey and is run schools. It also is organized internationally, so it runs schools in the United States. Um, in fact, there are hundreds of charter schools in the U.S. that are run by the Gulenists. They tend to emphasize math and science, um, and they've got good reputations in most of the places where they operate. So there are a lot of Gulenist schools in Texas, for example. Um, there have been some investigations into Gulenist schools in the United States um, on charges that, for example, they're using Turkish labor rather than hiring Americans, but I mean, for the most part, that they are not being investigated for um, links to terrorism, financing terrorism, violence, or any of those things. All right, it's more along the lines of: Are you violating labor laws? Are you violating tax laws? I mean, um, the AK Party and Hizmet had been allies for a long time because they were both pushing in the same direction. They were both interested in membership in the European Union, and they were both interested in um, pushing the military out of public life, and they're both Islamist organizations. So, you know, that sort of that just basic um, uh, sympathy between the two organizations, that these are groups of um, conservative religious people. Okay? Um, 
but it had become clear over the last several years that there were a number of disputes that had been opening up between the Gulenists and the AK Party. They weren't necessarily out in public, but when you look back, it becomes clear that there had become a, a pattern here. So they, um, they had disagreements about foreign policy. They had disagreements about uh, negotiating with the, uh, Turk the Turkish Kurds, the, the PKK organization. Um, they had differences over how the Gezi Park protests should have been, should have been handled. Um, but Erdogan thinks that he is now in a position that he doesn't need the Gulenists anymore, and he is going to marginalize them. And the first salvo in this war um, is in November of 2013. Erdogan makes a public announcement that he's going to close Kramer schools. Right? So in order to get into university in Turkey, everybody has to take a nationwide entrance exam. It is super competitive, and which school you go to depends on what your grade on the exam is. So Kramer schools are largely full of um, you know, Turkish seniors in high school who are studying for their college entrance exams. About a quarter of all of the Kramer schools in Turkey are run by the Gulenists, and it was a significant source of revenue for the, um, for the Gulenist organization. This did not go over well with the Gulenists, who immediately saw this as an attack on their autonomy. Um, they could see sort of what was, what was going on here. A month after that announcement, there is suddenly a major corruption scandal which um, bursts into view in Turkey. A prosecutor um, who was known to be a Gulenist, and, and by the way, this was someone who was involved in the Ergenicon trials at a very high level. So Erdogan was well aware of the kinds of tactics that this prosecutor would use, and he was fine with those tactics when it was the military. When it's his administration, that was a whole different story as far as he was concerned. Right? But they initiated raids, um, they arrested um, dozens of people, including three ministers sons. Okay, so three members of the cabinet, their sons are arrested. Um, and the, the charges are basically, um, well, when they, when they raided the homes of the places that they went, they found in some places literally hundreds of millions of dollars in foreign currency in shoeboxes. Right? And the, um, the minister's son who had all the money in his house uh, said he was fundraising for some kind of a project, a school or something. It was unclear why he could not keep all of that cash in a bank. Um, so public protests about the corruption scandal, you know, if the penguin with the gas mask was Gezi Park, the shoebox becomes a symbol of opposition to the perceived corruption of Erdogan's regime. I should. I should say, there is a great deal of corruption in Erdogan's regime. They are closely tied, for example, um, to large construction magnets. Erdogan loves big building projects. He built himself a palace in the capital that has 1,100 rooms in it. Right? He um, built a third bridge over the Bosphorus. He wants to make the airport in Istanbul the largest airport in Europe and cronies of his get these big construction contracts. In fact, the Gezi Park protests were around the idea that they were gonna tear the park down and put up a shopping mall, right? Um, so, I mean, there is definitely corruption within the, within the regime. It, the other piece to this that, that comes out, um, actually, is that um, there is a, a, a Oh, I don't want to go that far yet. There's a, there's a young Turkish gold trader named Reza Sharaf, who it is alleged paid bribes to a minister's son and the CEO of a major bank in Turkey. This is all part of an elaborate scheme 
whereby Turkey is trying to circumvent international sanctions on Iran. So Iran is supplying Turkey with inexpensive gas and um, uh, natural gas and oil. Turkey needs to be able to pay Iran, but the international banking system is closed to the Iranians as, as one of the sanctions that have been placed on them for their, uh, for their nuclear program. So they needed to find a way around this. And so they come up with this elaborate scheme whereby Reza Sharaf looks like he's exporting gold um, and somehow that ends up getting transferred to accounts that will allow it to go to Turkey and all the transactions are being laundered through Help Bank. All right. I will also tell you, Reza Sharaf ends up in the United States. He brings his family here to go to Disney World. <coughs> U.S. officials arrested him and um, one other person uh, who also was in the United States for tourism purposes. And uh, the trial just concluded um, a couple of months ago in New York. Reza Sharaf turned state's evidence and testified against the, um, the higher up Turkish official. Um, and they found them guilty. So, I mean, the United States was interested in this case and went after them because they were circumventing sanctions against the Iranians. So again, while some of the methods the Gulenists may have used to bring the corruption scandal out were a little shady, there was corruption. And the big piece, this effort to circumvent sanctions with the Iranians, it's very clear there's plenty of evidence to support that, right? And a U.S. federal court has, um, has already ruled on that. I could also mention, you can imagine how upset this has made Erdogan. Right? He has, was furious while this trial was going on in New York. Um, and um, they accused the judge, for example, of being a Gulenist. I mean, it just, and uh, because the state runs the media, not a whole lot of people in Turkey knew that the US was actually undertaking this prosecution. But anyway, right, I'm getting away from my main story. <laughs> So, corruption scandal. The government retaliates immediately. Erdogan says, this is an effort on the part of a parallel state run by the Gulenists trying to overthrow his government. Now, you've all probably heard the words deep state in the United States. I hate it when people talk about a deep state in the United States because Turkey is where that word originated, deep state. And what it describes is um, secret relationships between centers of political power, the security forces, and criminal elements. So during the 1970s and the 1980s, um, there was this cabal um, in which they, for example, went after the, the Kurds, all right? And they would use these criminal gangs to um, murder Kurdish opposition figures. Um, they would use them to go after Islamist figures. And it all became public in Turkey when there was a car accident um, and it involved um, a, someone who was on their top 10 wanted list Right? who was carrying a passport with a false name that had been issued to him by the Ministry of the Interior, the head of one of the major parties in Parliament, right? um, a general, um, and the head of a paramilitary force called the Grey Wolves, who were responsible for a, a, a lot of um, extrajudicial killings in Turkey. So people in Turkey know this history. They know what the deep state means. So for Erdogan to say the Gulenists are a parallel state, he is deliberately trying to tie that to people's fears of a previous deep state. And, um, so he says this is a, a you know effort by the Gulenist parallel um, parallel state. Pro-government newspapers put the U.S. ambassador on the front page 
and Erdogan starts speaking darkly about how an unnamed ambassador, but it was fairly clear since only the American ambassador was on the front pages of the papers, he's threatening to expel them because he's alleging that they are also part of this ghoulinous plot to bring him down. At other points he says that it is the interest rate lobby, which is an anti-Semitic slur, um, because Turkey's economy was doing too well. So the international interest rate lobby is out to get him. They were being abetted by an international media conspiracy which, if, which involved, and I am not making any of this up, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, the BBC, and Reuters. Right? At an earlier stage, Erdogan had also said Lufthansa was part of an international conspiracy against Turkey because he wanted Istanbul to be the largest airport in Europe. And of course, Lufthansa flies out of Frankfurt, which is the largest airport in, in Europe. So Erdogan is very prone to conspiracy theories and conspiracy language that fits in with the way many people in Turkey understand how politics works. Um, and so he's stirring up all these anti-American sentiments. Um, he's accusing the Gulenists of being responsible for this. And they shut the corruption investigation down completely. And the way they do this is by going after police officers, the prosecutors, and the judges. And these individuals are either um, reassigned oftentimes to the furthest portions of, of Turkey, or they are removed from their, from their offices. Um, within a month, the estimate was 2% of the police force in Turkey had been reassigned because they were connected in some way with um, this investigation. Um, Erdogan started threatening opposition politicians publicly. Right? alleging that he had files showing corruption, their involvement in corruption, or occasionally other things, by which he made it very clear that he meant he had sex tapes on his, on his rivals. Right? So he's trying to make sure that none of the other political parties are going to try to interfere uh, with closing down this investigation. And then finally, because again, he needs to undermine the investigation's legitimacy. He, so th this is December of 2013 when the corruption scandal breaks out. In the spring of 2014, he releases the military officers who had been convicted and imprisoned in the Ergenicon and Sledgehammer trials. He says what many people had been saying at that point, which was, um, these trials had been based on, um, on trumped up evidence. The trials were not legitimate. Uh, these individuals had not been plotting to overthrow the government, et cetera, right? Because he figures the military is not gonna be able to make a comeback given what has happened to it. And it has the benefit of making it look like the Gulenists all along have been this illegitimate force inside the government, you know, disrupting Turkey's ability to, to function democratically. So this brings us up to the 2015 elections. Erdogan needs a new parliament and he needs as many people in parliament as he can get so that he can amend the constitution and change Turkey to a presidential system, basically ratifying what he's already doing. And of course, I mean, AK had done really well in the three previous elections. So the, I mean, I think the AK party honestly believed that they were gonna do really well in this election. The results in June of 2015 actually were shocking. Right? The AK party only got um, 258 seats. Right? And the HDP right, crossed the threshold um, and won 80 seats. Why is that significant? So the HDP is the purple party, right? Those are the Kurdish areas of, of Turkey. And in order to get into parliament, you need to get 10% of the national vote. It is one of the highest thresholds of any parliamentary system in the world. And it is at 10% precisely to prevent the Kurds from getting representation in parliament. But the HDP, um, 
they ran a very smart campaign. They had um, a male uh, uh, and a female chair of the campaign. They attracted a lot of votes from young people. They tried to broaden their appeal beyond just the Kurdish issue. They reached out to environmentalists. They reached out to the LGBT um, activist community. They reached out to human rights communities. Right? So I actually was in Turkey um, for the elections and literally every one of my former students, and of course they're all secular, Western educated residents of Istanbul, but every one of them voted for the HDP. Okay, so there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm and this sense that, okay, so we went out and protested in Gezi, and now we have been able to restrict Erdogan's power through the election. So in the summer, there was a lot of optimism in Turkey that Erdogan was going to be, you know, reined in. But of course, that's not going to work um, for Erdogan because he wants to be able to have, um, uh, well, because they didn't, he didn't get enough seats, they are going to need to form a coalition government. And if they form a coalition government, then their constitutional amendments are not going to get through. So Erdogan um, decides that the easiest way to get around this is to discredit the HDP as a terrorist, as, a, as an organization, a party linked to a terrorist organization. So the PKK, which is the Kurdistan Workers Party, it is the party in Turkey, um, the guerrilla movement for the Kurds, there was a long civil war in Turkey fought by the PKK. They are considered a terrorist organization by the Americans, the European Union, etc. They did use terrorist tactics. Right? And uh, the HDP had very much distanced themselves from the PKK, but Erdogan begins this campaign talking about them as an extension of the PKK. Um, there is a major bombing in Turkey in the summer of 2015 in July that's carried out by ISIS. It mainly kills young Kurdish activists. They're furious because of Turkey's involvement in the war in Syria, where Turkey is standing by while the Kurds are getting slaughtered in Kobani. Right? You literally can see Kobani from the, but if you're standing at the Turkish border, you can see Kobani. And so the Turks stood there and watched this, you know, many months long battle. Um, and Kobani is a Syrian Kurdish city. So the Kurds were very angry and they blamed the, the um, Erdogan because they believed, and there's some evidence to support this, that he had really turned a blind eye to ISIS and allowed fighters to infiltrate from Turkey into Syria and Iraq to join ISIS. And so the PKK retaliated um, by killing two police officers. And this opens the door um, for Erdogan. A, uh, oh, sorry. So this is a, um, this is a picture of the, of the bombing that happened um, in, in the summer. In, And again, the, the, the criticism with, with Turkey is that it's more interested in um, suppressing the Kurds than it is in, um, in fighting ISIS. So Erdogan actually restarts the war in the southeast against the Kurds. And he uses this as a way to rally nationalist sentiment back to his administration. He says, we can't form a coalition government. We're stuck. I have to call new elections. So they call new elections for um, November of 2015, after which, I mean, at that point, you, the war with the Kurds has been pretty hot for three or four months. Erdogan is able to um, retake areas that had been previously taken by the nationalists. All right, um, I think this is set up for before and after, yeah. All right, so this is June. The red areas are um, a secular nationalist party, and you can see in November, 
most of those people end up switching their votes and they vote for the AK party. Some areas that had voted for the KDP also voted for the AK party in November. Um, and at this point, um, the AK party goes from having held 258 seats to 317 seats because they held the, um, the new election. It, um, and that is nearly enough to be able to just call the referendum for the, for the Constitution. It, in July of 2016, you have this ill-fated coup um, in Turkey. There's a state of emergency which actually is still in force in Turkey, but it allows Erdogan to rule by decree. Um, the coup has been used to foster a, a new quote-unquote founding myth for Turkey. So the original founding myth is um, lionizes the secularists and the military, right? Because it's the military that brought the Turkish Republic out in 1923. People in Turkey, particularly those who lived like out in the Anatolian Plateau in more rural areas who were very pious, never felt part of that because they, they weren't secularists, right? Um, they weren't really connected with the sort of European project of Ataturk and of, of the military. Um, and so Erdogan is able to tap into his support with the conservative religious groups um, and convince them that they stood up to the coup in July of 2016 and they saved the Turkish Republic. Right? So you had um, massive demonstrations for about a month after the coup into August um, in which Erdogan's supporters came out to celebrate that they had been able to um, defeat the coup. Simultaneous with that, you have a massive crackdown on the coup plotters. Right? Um, those who were arrested were, were badly mistreated. The um, individuals who died during the effort at the coup were actually buried in a cemetery on the outskirts of Istanbul um, that was uh, for traitors. Right? It's actually labeled as, as such. Right? He begins a massive purge. Right? The coup gives him the opportunity to clear out all of his opponents, right? The environmentalists, the human rights activists, um, the Gulenists, basically the, the press, anyone who is critical of Erdogan, he is now going to go after um, under the state of the emergency and with the, um, with the coup. He blames the coup on Fatullah Gulen and the Gulenist organization, which he renames the Fatullah Gulen Terrorist Organization, or the FETO. So now anyone who was a member of the Gulenist network, or who went to a Gulenist school, or who subscribed to a Gulenist newspaper, they are now being treated in Turkey as traitors. Respect. All right, um, and I mean that's where he really begins to um, really begins to to go after them. So this gives you a sense of the numbers of people that have been removed in Turkey um, in the aftermath of this of this coup in the summer. Um, from an American perspective, one of the worst outcomes was that um, within a month, uh, about 40 to 45 percent of the 325 generals and admirals in the Turkish military had been removed on the grounds that they were, were Gulenists. Um, most of these individuals were people who were pro-NATO. People who had served in the NATO offices, for example, in Europe. People who coordinated with the Americans at the NATO base in Inserlik in, in Turkey. Um, and so instead, Erdogan promotes people loyal to him who are distrustful of the Americans, distrustful of NATO, and more interested in a close relationship with the Russians. Um, one American an analyst said in the aftermath of the, uh, um, of the 
removals in the military, you're looking at a military whose top level officer corps is now fundamentally broken. So in the war in Syria against ISIS, the Americans are having a difficult time now coordinating with, with Turkey because of the fact that a large number of people it was used to working with have been removed. But it wasn't just in the military, right? This has been massive in Turkey. At least 1,500 civil society organizations have been closed down. All right, so like Friends of the Manitowoc Library, that's a civil so society organization. If they thought that you, know, you had Gulenist literature in the library, that would be the end. Your organization is closed down. Um, they confiscated the um, premises and then all of the equipment that belonged to most of these civil society organizations, which means it's going to be virtually impossible for them to, you know, start up. They'd literally be starting from, um, from scratch. Over 150 media outlets have either been closed or had their assets seized by the government. So it is now almost impossible in Turkey to get anything but the straight Erdogan party line view of what is taking place. Um, Turkey has jailed more journalists than any country in the world f for the last several years. So um, there are at least um, 73 journalists who are in prison in, in Turkey. Most of them have been charged with um, uh, spreading terrorist propaganda, for example. And by the way, spreading terrorist propaganda could mean that you wrote an editorial in your newspaper in which you suggested that there should be a negotiated end to the war in Syria or a negotiated end to the war in the southeast with the Kurds. You don't have to advocate violence to be a terrorist. You just have to criticize Erdogan's policies in Syria or in, in Turkey. Um, just in the last two weeks, there has been, um, they've arrested about two dozen students at Boazaji University, which is where I, I, I would teach summer school, on, and I have a lot of friends on the faculty there, but it's the best university in Turkey. It's the, you know, the hardest university to get into, and um, it has long had a reputation for being a liberal bastion of free speech, that it's like was one of those places, even when uh, women were not allowed on college campuses with headscarves, at Boazaji, you would see a lot of women who had their hair covered because they would wrap it up in a scarf and then put a hat on over top of that. Now that wouldn't have cut it most places, but it did at Boazaji. All right, so there's definitely, it has this, you know, they talk about it as the Boazaji ethos. So a group of Boazaji students um, put out a table and they were giving away free Turkish delight um, to celebrate Turkey's military victory in Afrin in Syria. And a group of other students um, then came up to them and they started arguing with them. You know, saying you shouldn't be celebrating. Um, you shouldn't be celebrating this. War is terrible. People are dying. Civilians are getting killed. There's nothing to celebrate here. And a fairly, I mean, there's no violence. A fairly robust argument breaks out. The Turkish government, it, within the next several days, it identified most of the counter, the, most of the people that were arguing with the kids at the table with the candy. It identified them and it arrested them. And they are now facing charges for being terrorists. It, um, and, uh, you know, the atmosphere now at the university is one of complete fear. Nobody wants to say anything publicly that could be interpreted as anti, um, anti Erdogan. You might think, um, well, okay, I just won't say anything publicly about this, except they're monitoring social media. Right? In the last month alone, over 800 people have been arrested in Turkey for a Twitter or a Facebook post, again, in which they questioned Turkish policy in Syria. Not advocating violence, not saying they love the PKK, not saying Erdogan should be removed, but criticizing policy. 
I would venture to guess every person in this room in the last 24 hours has criticized some policy of the United States government. <laughs> All right. If you used Twitter or Facebook to have done that and you were in Turkey, in the middle of the night you might end up with two dozen riot police breaking down your door and hauling you off to prison. Um, Turkey has begun arresting um, large numbers of um, high profile people. So the chair of Amnesty um, International, uh, the board of the Turkish Medical Association. Uh, these people are protesting for um, the editors and um, uh, journalists who write for um, one of the last major newspapers that was, um, which is now closed, in Turkey that had an anti, uh, or a, that didn't have a pro-government line, let's, let's put it that way. Um, unfortunately, most of these individuals are being convicted, and some of them are getting life sentences. I mean, this is not you're getting 30 days in jail, all right? Um, flimsy evidence, secret testimony, guilt by association. It, um, defendants no longer have the right to hear the evidence um, against them. Defense attorneys no longer need to be present um, during, the, during the trial. Um, you have lengthy pre-trial detention. Um, and there are widespread credible allegations of abuse, inhumane treatment, and torture. Right. Turkey had actually made a lot of, I mean, all of you are of the generation, you probably remember that movie about the American drug dealer that gets uh, arrested and sent to a Turkish prison, right? Um, and, uh, you know, so conditions, everyone knew they were very bad in Turkey. But when it wanted to join the European Union, it really made a lot of progress trying to get torture out of its um, uh, police stations, get it out of its interrogation rooms, get it out of its prisons. And all of that progress has now been, um, been backsliding. Some of the evidence that is being offered at these trials is literally ridiculous. Um, so there have been some people who have um, recently, um, oh yes, I, I forgot to mention Wikipedia has been blocked again in Turkey. Um, but some of the people who have been arrested, there's a recent case where um, they got life in prison they are charged with being a member of the Fatullah Gulen terrorist organization. And the evidence was they had an American $1 bill in their possession, and the serial number started with F for Fatullah Gulen. Okay. Literally, that is the evidence they brought forward publicly to explain why this very prominent academic has been sentenced to life in prison. Eight. Um, Freedom House uh, has since downgraded Turkey. Um, oh, so this is for the, the head of um, Amnesty International who has been, um, uh, has been arrested. Subliminal message on, on TV. They were the ones that had the $1 bill in their, um, in their possession. And so Freedom House has now downgraded Turkey to not free. It says that by the um, end of 2017, over 110,000 people had been suspended or dismissed um, from their um, public sector positions, and over 60,000 people had been arrested. Um, the website Turkey Purge, which is, is keeping track of what's going on in, in Turkey, actually puts the numbers at about 147,000 people. The sectors that have been hit the worst they are the security sector and the educational sector. So in April of 2017, um, Erdogan called his constitutional referendum. And despite all of the um, oppression, despite the state of emergency, you still had people in Turkey who tried to campaign for a no vote. Right? Um, and it was quite striking because when the Constitution came up, you had an 80% turnout. Right? Can you imagine if you got 80% turnout tomorrow? 80% <laughs> turnout. But they only got 51.3% yes 
and 48.7% no. So it's clear there is now significant opposition in Turkey to Erdogan. But the constitutional amendments have passed. They now have this extremely strong presidential system. Erdogan is clearly now going to be in power at least until 2019 when the next presidential elections would be. And he has publicly said he has every intention of staying in power until 2023 because that's the 100th anniversary of Turkey's um, founding, right, um, in 1923. So unfortunately, at the moment, there does not appear to be any checks on Erdogan's power in Turkey. The military has been um, pushed out. Civil society has been decimated. If you step out of line, you risk a long prison sentence in Turkey. The um, you know, free press, free speech, the media, that whole sector of the, of the country has just been closed down. And it does not at this point appear, despite how much opposition there is to, to Erdogan, it's not clear how they are going to be able to mobilize to put any sort of a break on him. AK has the majority in parliament as well, right? They did not, after November of 2015, they did not need a coalition government, so single party government again. Um, and Erdogan has now been stacking the military and the security forces um, with pro Erdogan loyalists. So on Wednesday, um, the leader of Iran, Vladimir Putin and Erdogan are meeting together in Istanbul to talk about policy in Syria. In, as all of this has been happening, um, Turkey's relationship with the United States has sustained severe hits. Um, Turkey is moving away from NATO. Right? We're actually in a situation in Syria where Turkish-backed forces might end up firing on U.S.-backed forces, and these are both supposed to be NATO members. But Turkey is moving in the direction of, of Russia. There seems to be a split in the U.S. government. The State Department under Rex Tillerson thought Turkey is more important than the Syrian Kurds who the U.S. is allied with to fight ISIS in Syria. So give up the Kurds if that makes Turkey happy. The Pentagon, on the other hand, will have none of it. Right? They do not want to abandon the Syrian Kurds because they say they're the only capable fighting force on the ground in Syria. And if we want to defeat ISIS, you can't just you know, hang the Syrian Kurds out to dry. Now that Rex Tillerson's out of the State Department, it's difficult to know where U.S. policy is, is, is going to go. Um, but I do think that meeting is very symbolic on Wednesday um, because at, at this point, um, Turkey's government looks much more like Vladimir Putin's Russia than a country that only a few years ago wanted to join the European Union and has been a member of NATO uh, for the last several decades. So I wish I could end on some sort of a positive note, but I, I only see um, bad things ahead um, for Turkey, as long as Erdogan is able to remain um, in power. So I would be happy to take any questions that anybody might have about any of this or about US policy. If you want to get more into Syria, um, I'd be happy to address that. You touched briefly on this, but the elections, I saw 79.5 million people in Turkey, of which 54 some, 54 million voted, and 86% turnout, that's phenomenal. And they, and they showed like 1.3 million were invalid votes. 
do they have a system that they know that there are 1.3 million invalid votes? I mean, how, first of all, how do all these people turn out? And how do they know they're all valid votes? Do they use the ink on the fingers? No, so um, the, the monitoring is at the, as, is at the poll sites, right? Um, they're using paper ballots um, in, in most of these locations and then they're, and then they're counting. So the, um, the constitutional referendum, there is credible evidence that um, there was tampering with uh, the results. That the, um, like within the last 24 hours of the, of the counting period, they decided that they were going to be willing to count votes that had not been um, properly validated. Um, and you know, given how close the referendum is, the assumption was that any kind of you know, fooling around with, the, with those numbers was to make Erdogan's victory look larger than it probably was. Um, so there, you know, in the other elections, there, I mean, there's not been tampering. There's, these have been, I mean, they have been certified as free and fair by international observers. It is a constitutional referendum, um, which people said was, was deeply flawed. And part of it had to do with um, the fact that there was a state of emergency <laughs> that was, you know, enforced throughout the entire country when that, um, when that happened. As far as how they get that kind of a, um, that kind of a turnout, um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I mean, Americans are complacent. We don't really think all that much of our right to vote, but in places where um, people have lost that right, you know, lots of people in Turkey, the military stepped in in 1980. They spent three years under an incredibly repressive military regime. Um, you know, there was the, the postmodern coup in 1997. Um, people value their ability um, to vote. And I mean, honestly, Turkey is not an outlier in this respect. If you look at, um, in elections where people think they'll be meaningful in Iran, you get massive turnouts, right? Lots of places in sub-Saharan Africa, people will stand in line for six hours in incredible heat and humidity to vote. Um, and I, I just think that um, they're not the outlier. We, it's our turnout that's, that's the outlier. Um, what is the general state of the economy there and what is the relationship between business and the government then? So um, the economy actually is, is, is um, still doing fairly well. Um, Erdogan does have close ties with a lot of these large um, business conglomerates. And the AK Party, um, its roots actually are in um, Islamic businessmen's associations that sprang up in the Anatolian um, heartland in the 1970s and, and 1980s. And they, they talk about them as the, um, the Anatolian tigers. And they very much have been supporting um, the AK party. They're one of the, the chief backers um, for that. So, you, you know, um, in that respect, significant sectors of the, um, of the economy are doing well because they are connected to, to Erdogan. That being said, you always have to be a, a little careful with Turkey. I mean, the Turkish economy has been fragile. It's had some major, you know, kind of craters uh, in the last 20 years or so. Um, but for right now, that, that does not seem to be a factor that could bring people out into the, into the streets. If the economy started to deteriorate, if people's standards of living started to fall, Erdogan might, might find it more and more difficult to hold on to um, his AK base of, of support. But, but for right now, that's not really an, not really an issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the week um, uh, we are going to have your um, 
your um, uh, your session, uh, we have a, a panel here, and uh, wh what I think they were saying is that um, actually uh, the the United States relations with, with Turkey is not going to be changed much because of the historical conflict that Turkey had with Russia about like three or four hundred years, many wars. And they felt pretty confident that uh, the, the NATO relations with, uh, with the U.S., is, uh, with, with Turkey is not going to be much alter that that um, the the leader of Turkey is is going is is a Turk basically that was saying and it's not going to go very deep with Russia and the question is uh, uh, what's happening with the Turkish military now and the coup was a fraction of the military or was representative across the board of the Turkish military. No, so the, um, the coup was um, just a small faction of the military. It's still not entirely clear who actually was responsible um, for, the, for the coup. There is some speculation that um, Gulenist officers may have been involved in this because they got wind of the fact that Erdogan was planning to purge them from the military, and so they moved to... Um, prevent that from happening. But they had to move earl much earlier than they had meant to before all the plans were together. So that's, that's one theory that's been offered. Um, there are other people um, who say that they don't think that the coup could have been organized by the Gulenists because it was such a bad coup. It was so disorganized. And they said if there's one thing the Gulenists are good at, it's organization. Right, and the coup was just you know like um, so the picture that I had of the of the military forces on the bridge, they closed half of the bridge over the Bosphorus. Right, only traffic in one direction got closed, and there's another bridge you know a couple miles up the Bosphorus which they didn't close. They didn't um, secure the airport in Istanbul. They went into the offices of, you know, the, the studios of, of CNN Turk, but then they didn't hold on to them. I mean, there are all kinds of weird things. Um, the coup was clearly um, very poorly planned. And so that has led others to think that perhaps, actually, um, and this is the conspiratorial um, answer, is that er Erdogan and his backers may have had something to do with this. <laughs> All right, that, that they may have encouraged um, uh, dissatisfi a dissatisfied faction in the military to attempt a coup, precisely so Erdogan could crush it and then crush the Gulenists as, as a result. Um, but the, the outcome of the coup has been anybody they thought was a Gulenist has been purged from the military. So now in the upper echelons of the, um, of the officer corps, you do have a lot of um, individuals who are much more skeptical of the US and of NATO and much friendlier towards Russia. Um, as far as whether or not you know, the, the US relationship with Turkey and Turkey's relationship with, with NATO, um, a lot is going to rest, I think, on what happens on the ground in Syria. So right now, Russia is allowing Turkey to secure its interests in the north against the Syrian Kurds, because that right now is also in Russia's interests. But at a certain, and, and, and Turkey can only operate in the north because it has Russia's permission. At a certain point, though, if Russia and Turkey's aims in Syria diverge, then that's going to put a lot more pressure on the potential for, um, you know, for Turkey and Russia to, to move closer. But Turkey is, um, Erdogan's administration has been sort of um, revving up anti-Americanism. Uh, you know, it went after the U.S. ambassador, for example. Um, Erdogan's bodyguards beat up a bunch of people outside the Turkish embassy in a protest the last time Erdogan was in Washington, D.C., which caused a big diplomatic 
incident with the um, with the United States. Um, and then just in the last few days, I, I guess um, President Macron in France said that France was going to um, back the Syrian Kurds, the ones the Americans are, are supporting. And Erdogan um, just, you know, as, as he is wont to do, just went off the handle and, um, it, you know, has been threatening France, has been threatening Macron, has been saying that he's, you know, um, he's a supporter of terrorists. With the killings in, in Gaza um, the other day by Israel, Erdogan publicly said that, um, you know, uh, that Netanyahu was a terrorist. So there are signs that Turkey at the moment sees its interests as more aligned with the Russians than, than with NATO. But again, I think much of that calculation has to do with policy towards the Kurds in both Turkey and in, and in Syria. And as long as the United States is, is backing the Syrian Kurdish forces, U.S.-Turkish relations are going to be bad. If, if that changes, then they probably couldn't repair things. Um, but relations right now are about as bad as they have been in recent memory between the U.S. and, and Turkey. I'm heading towards you. Uh, beforehand, I spoke to you, and you said you were going just for a week this yeah. summer to Turkey, and that you were very careful about what you were emailing or sending to students over there. Do you feel safe? Will you come back? Will you be there? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I wish this was a frivolous question, but um, there's a very um, prominent uh, American academic um, who's been writing about Turkey for, you know, for decades. He happened to be in Istanbul like a few days before the coup happened um, at a conference on, Bu on Buyukadu, which is this little island off the coast of Istanbul. It's beautiful. It's like a little tourist thing. But I mean, there's a bunch of, ba uh, of academics holding a conference. Well, after he left Turkey, um, the Turkish government has um, claimed that he and other members of this conference were there to plot the overthrow of the government, and there are arrest warrants out for them. So Henry Barkey can't go back to, to Turkey. Um, most of my friends, and again, because they're all, you know, everyone I know in Turkey is Western educated, secular, um, but um, the, my closest friend um, on the faculty at Boazici, who is um, somebody I went to grad school with, um, for the first few months after the coup, we, we were afraid to even email her because we knew that things like Twitter and Facebook were being, were being monitored. Um, and she and her husband and her son have since left the country and have, they've gone into exile. Um, I was in, or was I, um, not in Franklin, you know, outside of Milwaukee a couple of months ago. Um, and I was talking to some people there who are from Turkey. Uh, and these are um, individuals who had been in the United States when the coup happened, and um, about a half dozen of them said that their passports had been canceled by the by the Turkish government. So th they're they're not able to to go back. Um, and uh, Turkey wants Fethullah Gulen. Okay, they told the Americans they want. Fatula Gulen to be extradited to Turkey. And the US said, well, we have a process for that. You would need to give us some evidence. So they sent 80 boxes of evidence. And Fatula Gulen is still in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I mean, the Americans, I think, were sort of like, mm, we said evidence, right? But because Turkey is convinced that they need to get Fatula Gulen, they have actually arrested at least a dozen Americans. Um, and in particular, there are uh, some uh, religious leaders, some faith leaders, and um, people are, are calling it hostage diplomacy. That Turkey has arrested these Americans and they are using them in an effort to um, basically to trade them with the, um, with, with the, um, you know, trade with the administration to get Fethullah Gulen back. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not concerned that I'm going to get arrested, but what I would be concerned is that I might not be able to go back again. 
um, after this after this summer, um, and uh, be because they are monitoring. Um, what people are saying and people who have been critical of Erdogan um, even who aren't in Turkey um, I don't know if any of you remember there was an NBA player mm -hmm. actually right who they they put an arrest warrant out for him and the NBA was able to get him um, back to the United States but I mean it's that level of of um, that, that that Erdogan is going after their um, going after their their critics and their and their opponents, right? Um, and uh, I just know that my friends in Turkey are extraordinarily careful about what they say and about what they put in writing, right? So I would not. I mean, the only reason I'm going this summer is I was there in, in 2015, and I haven't gone back since then. Precisely because I, I, I don't want to go back. Um, I, you know, I disagree so strongly with what Erdogan is doing. But we have a, um, a study abroad program in Turkey. So we have to go visit our partner university. Um, just to give you another example. So their, their guy, their international education coordinator, came to Beloit a couple of weeks ago. And um, you know, he was supposed to visit classes. So he was going to come to my human rights seminar in which we were talking about civil and political liberties in Turkey. And I told him that, and, and he said, oh, well, I, I, you know, I didn't have anything to do with any of it. And I said, no, no, no. I said, you could just you know, explain what the situation is like at your university, you know, just what your observations are. You know? And I told my class in advance, I said, look, you know, he's going to be very careful about what he says. So even if he says things that you realize are probably untrue, don't push. Just listen. This is, you know. And um, he, he didn't show up. I, I got an email from him about 10 minutes after my class started saying that in response to an email that I had sent him earlier in the day about what time my class started, telling me that he would get there um, five minutes before the class ended. And he did it to somebody else, the Beloit faculty. And, and you know, we all thought he just didn't want to publicly have to say anything about what's happening in Turkey. Um, and so he avoided that um, at all costs, um, e even though I don't know who, who he thought might turn him in. But anyway, so yeah, I, I wouldn't go if I didn't have to. I'm not especially happy about it. Um, but I certainly will be careful about what I say while I'm there. I have a question over here. Oh, yes. If Turkey and Russia align, mm -hmm. and with the unrest in the European area, what what does this foretell us in the future for that area? Mm. Well, I, I think it, at least in terms of Turkey, then it just reinforces the um, kind of authoritarian repressive nature of this particular regime. Um, it's going to make it harder for there to be any kind of negotiated settlement with the um, Kurdish population in the southeast, um, which means that that is going to continue to fester. Um, but as far as, as um, how this might spill out into other parts in, in Europe, I think this is just part of that sort of the general trend that we have been seeing um, towards an erosion of uh, democratic values and democratic practices throughout Europe and more of an emphasis on sort of like the conspiratorial mindset, the xenophobia, um, et, et cetera. Um, so I think Turkey is part of a larger trend. Um, it's just that it, it, at this point, has gone further than, than, like, say, Poland, for example, which is, you know, or Hungary, which are both very illiberal places at the moment. Um, but t Turkey, I think, is further along the slope to just being full-fledged Russia um, than, in, than anybody else. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So On my way. <laughs> what do you know about Erdogan himself? I mean, What's his education? What kind of background did he have? Is he narcissistic? Um, you know, does he <laughs> remind you yes. of anybody else? <laughs> yes, he is narcissistic. 
<laughs> so um, <clears throat> Erdogan, actually, I don't know about, about his education. I do know that um, he actually was like a semi-professional um, football player in, in Turkey. He played for one of the big Istanbul clubs. Um, and so I always forget that he's tall. He's about six foot one. Um, because in my mind, I, I always think he's not. But you know, he had a meeting with Vladimir Putin in, in Moscow, and he actually made Putin wait. And then when he walked into the room, of course, he is substantially bigger um, than Vladimir Putin. Um, and I'm sure Putin did not appreciate that. But so anyway, so he was a, a semi-professional football player in, um, in Istanbul. He became the mayor of Istanbul. He um, had a lot of support even amongst your Western secular educated types because actually he made the city run better. Um, and it, it was because he did such a good job as the mayor of Istanbul that he was able to launch his um, political, national political career. He read a poem um, in the late 1990s at a political rally in which there were, there were lines that said things like, um, you know, like, the minarets are our rifles. Anyway, there was some language that um, put religious imagery and military imagery together. And the military, which at that point was still very powerful, um, he was actually arrested and sent to prison for having said this poem publicly. So there was a lot of sympathy for, for Erdogan as someone who um, you know, had been trying to exercise freedom of speech and had been slapped down by the military. And when the, um, with the AK party and you know, when he first becomes prime minister, um, he's very pro-European Union. And they put and, and they talked. They talked the language of democracy because at that stage, that's what benefited the AK Party, right? Um, and there were a lot of democratic reforms in Turkey as a result of that. In the first, um, you know, four or five years of Erdogan's rule, this is why he keeps getting reelected. Um, they stabilized the economy. So the Turkish, um, when I first started going to Turkey, um, the lira was uh, denominated in millions. So, you know, you would have, and the largest was what was like a 25 million lira note, which was worth about $16, <laughs> all right? Um, when I would get paid there, I would get paid in billions of lira, right? It made me feel very wealthy. Um, but they stabilized the economy. Um, they went through a big IMF, um, you know, stabilization program, and when they came out at the other end, they knocked six zeros off the currency, and so then they, the um, the lira has been floating against the dollar at, at about, uh, I think it's at around one one dollar is one point three lira or some around there. But anyway, I mean, it's a pretty it's a pretty favorable exchange rate. Um, you saw a lot of, and I, uh, you know, even before the coup, I would always say, I hate to say this, but um, all of Erdogan's building projects in Istanbul actually made the city much better. Um, the transportation in the last 10 years is much improved, much, much, much improved, which is good for their tourist industry, right? Um, and in the early years when Erdogan was, was prime minister, you know, all my secular friends, they're convinced that he was going to turn Turkey into an Islamist country, right? Their nightmare was it was going to be Iran. And you always push them and be like, well, do you have any evidence of that? I mean, what, is, what exactly has he done that is so Islamist? And they really didn't, couldn't really point to anything. And so now I feel kind of guilty because it turns out they were right to be fearful of Erdogan, but for the wrong reason, not because he's an Islamist, but, but because he's you know, an authoritarian figure. And then about the narcissism, one of the other reasons why before the coup, this is like 2013-ish, this is part of why people went out in Gezi Park. Erdogan has a tendency to tell people how to live their lives. So he, um, how many children should women have? He has an opinion on that. What kind of bread should you eat at breakfast? He has an opinion on that. I mean, just all of these micromanaging pronouncements that he would offer, and he does not like to be challenged. Does not like criticism, um, and responds 
well out of proportion to what it is, and his favorite, um, you know, his go-to response to everything is, "You are a terrorist." Um, and um, <laughs> yes, actually, he does. And the the the, the best part was when he banned um, Twitter. Several members of his cabinet continued to use it um, publicly, and uh, and also, I mean, people in Turkey were pretty savvy about this. They um, they figured out how to get around around it. And it was actually embarrassing at a certain point for Erdogan because, it, you know, he had banned Twitter and everyone was still using it in, um, in Turkey. But yes, he has a Twitter account. Um, I wish I had footage of this because um, one of my friends in Turkey sent it to me one time and I thought, well, this totally sums up Erdogan. He couldn't make it to a rally. This had to have been about... Um, this might have been for the 2015 elections. He couldn't make it to a rally, and so he beamed a hologram of himself into the into the rally. And you see, you know, everybody standing there, and then above, it's above the crowd. It's like a 15 foot hologram of Erdogan, like shimmers out, and suddenly he's standing there, and the crowd goes goes wild. I thought that's sort of how he sees himself. I think in Turkey. Mm -hmm. yeah. You say that there are no checks on him, and I was thinking he doesn't seem to care about NATO and the European Union anymore. Nope. Does NATO have any power to like kick him out, the European Union to kick him out? Would that make any difference to him? Well, the European Union I mean, um, has long made it clear that Turkey wasn't getting in. And so, you know, that, that, that's not a carrot they can really dangle in, in front of them anymore. Um, and, uh, and as far as, uh, as, as NATO goes, um, not, not really. I mean, they're, 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 it really, I mean, they're, the real question actually is whether or not NATO wants to expel Turkey. Because it's not just a military alliance. NATO also is a political alliance of Western democratic countries. And there is some question now um, as to if he continues on this path, that maybe NATO needs to send the signal that his behavior is unacceptable and suspend him. But. Indrilik Air Base is in Turkey, and NATO is using that to, um, uh, as a platform for some of the bombing runs into Syria against ISIS. So as long as ISIS is still running around um, in Syria, the likelihood that, um, it, or if um, the Americans have special forces on the ground in Iraq and in um, Syria, as long as that is true, I can't see NATO risking the loss of Indrilik Air Base. Hello. Um, what hold does he have over Europe in the sense that uh, when my daughter worked at Lesbos for six months, she, lots of people were being pushed back to Turkey and being expelled from Lesbos back to Turkey. If they ever passed through the air of Turkey, they got put back there. What does he get out of that by saying, I'll take them? Yeah, so there are um, well over two million Syrian refugees who are in, in, in Turkey. Um, and um, the uh, Turkey got um, aid and assistance from the Europeans in return for that. But that's another one of those things that he can sort of um, dangle over the West is that um, if they push Turkey too hard, then they could always allow the refugees to continue their their movement from from Turkey. Right? Um, Erdogan originally, you know, in Syria, he thought Assad was going to be overthrown in six months, and so they welcomed Syrian refugees initially because they didn't think they were going to stay. And of course, that is not at all how things worked out in um, in. Uh, in Syria, so that you end up with this massive um, population, but it's largely just the aid and assistance um, that the that the Europeans offered if he would keep the refugees in Turkey. No. Anyone? No. 
All right, then that brings our last great decision of this year to a close. Thank you so much, Professor Doherty. Have a great evening and go vote tomorrow. Have a good night.